are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Adam Sultani, the executive director of the Oklahoma chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations Care. Adam, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Adam, I saw a disturbing article online just a bit ago about this U.S. Air Force veteran who was thrown on the no-fly list and then taken off and then thrown back on. It's been going on, it looks like, since November. I want to get into that in a moment, but before we do, for the benefit of the listeners, can you give them a little bit of background about CARE in Oklahoma and what you do for them? Okay, yes, I would be glad to. I'm the executive director of the Oklahoma chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations. We're a local chapter of the national organization, and we've been here since 2006. I am the third executive director, and we do two main things. We defend rights and we defeat intolerance within the state of Oklahoma. And it's not just for Oklahoma Muslims, it's for Oklahomans in general. Many of the cases we work on, the civil rights and civil liberties cases, impact people of all faiths and all ethnicities. So it's really something neat to be a part of. So when we're not busy defending rights and working on civil rights cases, we work to defeat intolerance. We do a lot of outreach to interfaith groups, to colleges, universities, and local communities to help them understand more about Oklahoma Muslims and Islam in general. Okay. Are there a lot of Muslims in Oklahoma? We estimate there's about 30,000 Muslims in Oklahoma with about not more than 15 total Islamic centers and schools. So it's not a huge, huge community when you take a look at, you know, cities like Chicago where they estimate about 400,000 Muslims. We're much smaller, but nevertheless, it is a tight-knit, close community and growing every day. Okay, so you guys are basically there to confront and counter the ignorance about Muslims in the United States, specifically the increase of it after 9-11, I guess, right? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, unfortunately. The Muslims were blamed for 9-11 when all the evidence shows that they had nothing to do with it, but that's a whole other story. But let's turn our sights to this poor fella, Sadiq Long. Is that how you say it? Yeah. So here's a U.S. Air Force veteran. He worked in Qatar, in Mm -hmm. Doha, Qatar, and he teaches English there, right? Yeah, he works as a translator and teaches ESL, English as a second language. And he lives there with his wife and her two children? Well, actually, no, there's only one child, her daughter, and then the other child is old and he's on his own somewhere in the U.S. Okay. So what happened was he wanted to fly from Qatar to Oklahoma to visit his mom, right? Correct. And she's ill. Yes, she has congestive heart failure. So why don't you start from the beginning, where this saga started to unfold? Okay, yeah, we'll be glad to. Actually, it almost spans back a little bit more than one year ago. So in January of 2012, Mr. Long got a call from his family stating that, you know, his mother's been diagnosed with congestive heart failure, and the doctors are running tests and put her on medication and so on. And of course, his instinct, as anyone's would be, was to travel back as soon as he could to see her. So the earliest he could arrange was April, due to his employment status and whatnot, And he also had to save money to buy the ticket because he works just like many people do paycheck to paycheck. So by April, he was able to book the ticket. He was booked to leave in early April 2012. But 24 hours prior to his departure, he got a phone call from the head of security at Doha Airport who told him he would not be able to board the plane. His name was flagged in their system and he would have to contact the embassy. He immediately contacted the embassy and they said they'd get back to him. And it was about a month later when they directed him to the department of Homeland Security. He filled out whatever paperwork they asked for and tried to get answers from them. And from May till August, he was pursuing Department of Homeland Security, also working with the embassy, and also reached out to congressmen and women and senators and the governor here in Oklahoma, hoping that someone would help. He got a few replies, I believe, from the governor's office, as well as, I believe, uh, I want to say Senator Tom Coburn's office, that said they were unable to help. It was a matter of national security, and he would have to contact his embassy to find out, which is exactly what he had been doing. So finally, in August, he reached out to CARE Oklahoma, and we talked. We took a couple weeks to look at all the information and discuss with him and find out what's going on. And finally, in September, we accepted the case and began working on it. And still, it took us another two months before he was able to fly out of Qatar and come back to Oklahoma. Do they happen to let anyone know why he was put on this list? No, and that's the strange thing about it. So what happened was when he contacted us, I mean, we, of course, worked on the case in September. We instructed him to, okay, let's book the flight as soon as you could. Again, he had the same situation where he needed to save some money, prepare for time off. So he decided to book the flight on November 8th with the hopes he can make it back in time for Thanksgiving. On that day, November 8th, he went to the airport. He didn't get any phone call ahead of time, just went to the airport hoping he'd be able to travel. And when he got there, they again told him, no, I'm sorry, you're going to have to contact the embassy. Same story as six months prior. 
So when he got back to us, that's when we got to work on things. We announced through a press conference that he would be trying to travel again in about what, the 18th, 19th, I'm sorry, so about 11 days from there. And then additionally to that, our attorney with Care National, Gadir Abbas, he uh, contacted his Secretary of State and Department of Justice. Finally, on November 15th, 2012, we got a message from the Department of Justice stating that he would be able to book a flight to travel after November 15th. It didn't give any explanation as to why. It didn't say this is permanent or temporary. It was just that one line that stated he would be able to book a flight after that date. And as many people know, he was able to travel on the 19th to come back to Oklahoma. Where is he now? He's still here in Oklahoma City. His mother lives in McAllister, and he's been back and forth. He's here in Oklahoma City at this time because he's still trying to get out. Unfortunately, you know, his wife and child, they're over there, and they really needed him to return so he can get back to work. He attempted to fly on February 6th from Oklahoma City Airport. I was with him, and unfortunately, he was unable to travel on that date. When we were at the airport, we went to the Delta ticketing counter and stood there for about 20 to 30 minutes while the Delta agent made phone calls and was on the phone for a while. He didn't say anything specifically to us. He somehow signaled for security to come over. He just hung up the phone and said, it will be a few minutes. Next thing we know, three police officers approach and they talk to the guy and kind of whisper and say what's going on. And then they signal a TSA agent to come over. And finally, he talks to us and tells us that they were unable to clear Mr. Long through corporate security. And it's a matter of national security and he'd have to contact a local FBI field officer office to find out more information. The bizarre thing about it is a week prior to that, our attorney with Care National sent a letter to the local FBI field office stating his exact itinerary and that he'd be traveling on that date and asking them or really pleading with them to allow him to travel without any difficulty. Mr. Long was never contacted by the FBI after that letter was sent. So this was February 6th? February 6th was the date of the flight. A week prior to that was when the letter was sent to the FBI. So the guy's stuck in Oklahoma. I mean, he's, yeah. with, he's with his mom, right, I guess. but He's here still staying with family. It's been a, a little bit stressful on not only his family here, but even his family over in Qatar who really were crushed when they heard the news. They were really hoping that he'd be able to travel. And, you know, the funny thing about it is, you know, it's almost understandable, I guess, to have a little bit more stringency on letting people into our country, if you want to call it a matter of security. But why not let someone out? They didn't want to let him in in the first place. So, you know, why not let him? go back to Qatar then. I, 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 you know, I grew up in the United States. You did too, right? Yeah. It's kind of changing a little bit, isn't it? It, it is. It doesn't seem to be the same country that we grew up in anymore. I mean, with these ridiculous, nonsensical, illogical things that are happening. Now, this guy, he's got a job back home. Yeah. He might not have the job when he gets back. They might have to hire somebody else. That is a correct. And, you know, it's not just he's losing time from work, so he's losing income. The stress that is taking on his family, on top of that, he has to continuously rebook his travel plans. I mean, there's just a plethora of things that are really impacting him and his family. And it's really just unfortunate that he's being singled out. I mean, he's always stated from the very beginning he's willing to sit down and talk with FBI officials and law enforcement and answer any questions or concerns they have. And he's even gone as far to say, you know, if you really are concerned about safety, you know, just put an air marshal on the plane next to me and let them escort me from here back to Qatar. I mean, it would seem to be logical to do that, but, <laughs> we, you know, we're just as confused as he is and not sure exactly why this is being done. And nobody can help. None of the elected representatives can do anything. Not as far as we know. Our attorney at Care National is putting together a plan and hoping that we can figure out a way to get him back. But it's very confusing. And I guess it really goes back to the source of the problem in that we don't know if he's on this list technically because the FBI won't confirm or deny if people are on the no-fly list. So that's one issue. The second issue is we don't know why. No explanations are given. With all the cases CARE has worked on around the country for people who have been on the no-fly list, there's never been an explanation given as to why a person has been on on this list. So it's really quite a confusing situation. Yeah, you would think that they would have a little bit more respect for people. And because they're telling nothing about this matter, they would try to get to the bottom of it fast so they don't ruin his life any more than they have. I mean, that would seem to make sense, but yeah. perhaps they don't have any respect for these people. I guess that's what yeah. it seems to be. Yeah, and unfortunately, Dave, you know, one of the problems we've noticed creeping up in our country is that a lot of times when you're a Muslim, you're guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> uh, we're told innocent until proven guilty, but when you're Muslim, sometimes the case is not quite the same. Yeah, they did quite a job on the Muslims from 9-11. They did a great job on them. 
Now, this fella, he served his country in the U.S. Air Force for 10 years. That's correct, yeah. Wow. He's actually been stationed in California, Germany, Turkey, and I believe his last station was in New Mexico. So he's 43 or 44 years old, and right. he grew up here in the United States? Yeah, yeah, he lived, in, I mean, except for the time, of course, he was in the Air Force where they were constantly moving. But yeah, he did live in the United States, and he only moved after his conversion to Islam and the time he was stationed overseas in Turkey. He fell in love with the culture of the Muslims and some of the things that are associated with Middle Eastern culture, and he decided, he and his wife, to go over and give it a try, and they really just enjoyed it, lived in Egypt and United Arab Emirates and currently residing in Qatar. Yeah, of course, the United States is supposed to be founded on religious freedom, but not where Muslims are concerned, it seems. At people. times, yes. So what do you think is going to happen? We don't know. You know, we're kind of back to square one, but hoping that some of the same people who managed to help the first time around, which we don't have exact names, but hopefully somebody will hear his plea and will at least grant, I guess, another temporary pass for him to travel and get back to Qatar. You know, we're open to the ideas, but as I said, the lack of communication has made it difficult for us to understand what we can do to help the situation. We just hope we can get him home and in a timely manner. Now, you do this pro bono, right? Yeah, each case is unique, so it's all always taken on a case-by-case basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how does CARE subsist? Through donations? Yeah. CARE is a non-profit 501c3 organization that is funded by donor contributions. Okay. And if they wanted to donate money, what would they do? They can go on our website. It's careoklahoma.com. That's C-A-I-R, Oklahoma.com. And the national website is care.com, C-A-I-R.com. Adam Zoltani, the executive director of the Oklahoma chapter of CARE, which is the Council on American-Islamic Relations. I want to thank you so much for the time you spent explaining all this to the listeners. Thank you for what you're doing to help this fellow out and all the other people. And looking forward to talking to you in the future when this case hopefully resolves and hopefully real soon. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it.